In 2018, the Happiness Alliance hosted a panel at the 6th OECD World Forum, Statistics, Knowledge and Policy, the Future of Wellbeing. Among the panelists was John Hallowell, editor of the World Happiness Report and Global Happiness Policy Report. He spoke about a revolution without losers. Uh, to actually change the ship of state in how it's managed, starting from the top and going down, is a very long process. It's usually not a very effective process. And we've seen now it's been almost 20 years, the number of national governments that have really turned the system around. And when you think about the sociology and the politics and so on, that's not a complete surprise. But most of the things we talk about that are important, in fact, actually happen on the neighborhood, on the street, in the household. Uh, and then you say, well, I'd like to be able on a bigger scale to do some of these things. This is the rough story I was telling yesterday. Um, and uh, you, you can read all those, but I'm talking really about the partnerships for happiness to build the silos, because this is in fact what many of you are involved in doing. And every conversation I get into here, I hear from different people's perspectives how they do that. Some of the examples we're using in the uh, forthcoming Global Happiness Policy Report, and I went through all the silo-based advice to the government departments about how to build happiness. What seemed to be missing were enough examples like the ones that many of you work on. And so I dug around and found a number of uh, intergenerational connection devices, you see, because it's not going to happen coming from a normal education background. It's not going to come from a, a, a background of healthcare. It's not going to come from the social services. There's nobody actually in charge of, of saying, wait a minute, from a happiness perspective, things the family used to do, we have to now permit uh, other, I have to provide other ways of getting there. And of course, it turns to be pure magic. If you manage to get a grade six class being taught not in this regular facility, but in an elder care facility where their friends and classmates and lunch meets are <clears throat> 10 times their age, uh, there's magic for both. You give a purpose and a, a job, um, all the things we know are important for building happy lives to the elderly, and you certainly do it for the young, and everyone knows, of course, you learn by what you see and, and not by what you're told. And so these kids are getting the most important lessons of their school career uh, just in their daily life and not in what people are telling them, what they're seeing and what they're living. Well, that's really important for uh, all the organizations. I have enough friends and colleagues around here to know the variety of organizations and links you span. So let me use my remaining how many minutes? Okay, my remaining four. Uh, to present something that occurred to me uh, only yesterday that it hasn't been taken proper advantage of. We tend to talk in the OECD circles and other circles about how we're adding something to the uh, economics by putting in non-economic considerations. And of course that's often seen as threatening from the point of view of those whose jobs are designed and deliver economic policy. Uh, and so I was thinking about having someone like Gary Gillespie who's really taking a broad view and sort of adding it on to the edge of the finance portfolio. I said, it's about time we stopped doing that and recognize the foundational importance of what well-being permits us to do. Because these measures I was talking about yesterday are in fact the measures that the founders of economics 300 years ago had in their minds, the whole idea about economics had nothing to do with commercial activity. Economics was about finding better ways um, to enable people to live happier lives. Of course, they didn't have measures of utility at that time, but we now have them. So we can now say to economics, we can go back to the roots of your discipline and broaden what you were doing. You don't have to throw away any of your tools. You don't have to throw away any of your insights, your, your ability to look at interdependencies and solve them and to try and look at people and their welfare in different walks of life. That's what they're used to doing in narrowly economic space. But now, this is not non-economic space we're talking about. It's broadly economic space. So that it's now a revolution that can take place with no losers because uh, for those who might have thought themselves threatened by the addition of other players, 
can say, no, actually, by the way, you've been operating without knowing it in our turf. <laughs> and of course, they will realize once they look at these primary measures of well being, uh, in fact, to think you own the turf is not the best way to get happiness. Thank you. How can you bring the happiness revolution to your home and to your life? Go to happycounts.org to get tools and resources for your happiness and for the happiness of your community and our world.